I asked if I got to keep the hat. They tell me no. <laughs> Thank you, President Ferguson. Trustees, members of the faculty, family members, and of course, you graduates of the class of 2001. Yeah, give it up, come on. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, I have two sons who graduated from Vassar, one in 95 and one in 99, so they didn't overlap at all. That gives me eight total years of uh, experience in the Poughkeepsie area. Parents get nostalgic, too. I hit the uh, Taconic, which I know from my kids is really the catatonic freeway. <laughs> and immediately I'm finding PDH on the radio and <clears throat> looking for Katim. Is Katim still there? Do you even know? Nah, you guys, forget it. <laughs> Let it go. My son Owen said you wouldn't know, so. Last week, next week, this week, all over America, young men and women, some not so young, in caps and gowns, are listening to scholars, politicians, eminent thinkers, probably Oprah Winfrey somewhere, Send them forth into their lives. You here at Vassar have invited the man commonly known as America's boogeyman to do that. And I have to ask you, what were you thinking? <laughs> what in God's name were you thinking? Maybe you thought I'd take the day off and paint you a shining picture. Shine and get it, that one's mine. <laughs> I got the royalties on that one. Of a glorious American future where George W. Bush rules like Glinda the Good. <laughs> with Dick Cheney at his right hand and John Ashcroft at his left. Not gonna happen, W may be the Wizard of Oz, but he's no Glinda, and the boogeyman never takes the day off. I guess no one told you that. And now, it's too late. <laughs> In that spirit, I want you to take a look around, I'm very serious about this, and imprint this cheerful scene on your mind. Make it a mental Kodak moment. Now close your eyes. Come on. Nobody's going to ask you to pray. Don't be afraid. Close your eyes. <laughs> All right. With your eyes closed, I want you to cast your faculty. Eyes closed. <laughs> your eyes aren't closed. Uh, okay. I want you to cast your mind 100 years into the future. It's May 20th, 2101. Imagine this stage, this area, these folding chairs on that same hill. But now there's a sign over the whole works that says, Vassar welcomes the survivors of the 2001 commencement exercises. Keep your eyes shut a moment longer, okay? They put out a chair for everyone here today. May 20th, 2101. There's one for each student, one for each parent, one for each grandparent, one for each sibling, one for each faculty member, one for each invited guest. Now with your eyes shut, and your mind cast 100 years in the future, I have to ask you, do you see those folding chairs? And the answer is, of course you do. Your imagination is getting a great view of them because if we reuned a hundred years from today, we wouldn't need to hold the festivities on the side lawn at Vassar. We could get everyone into the newsstand at the Courtyard Marriott on Route 9. We're looking at some marvelous medical advances over the next hundred years. Most cancers will be treatable and beatable, at least for those who have the resources. With genetic tailoring, a good many children may actually be born cancer immune. But none of those wonder children are here today. We have incredible new drugs to protect against stroke and heart attack. Drugs which should be almost unnecessary given what we now know about the lifestyle markers leading up to stroke and heart attack. But what we know and how we behave are often divergent paths. Human nature is for the most part an alligator that just wants to doze in the sun. 
and snatch whatever happens to wander too close. We know too much cholesterol is bad for us, but God, I love a box of French fries, and I know I'm not the only one because I've seen the waistlines. Our pills and treatments are largely designed to work in spite of human nature, and more and more often they actually do that. Given what we now know about the human genome, there are apt to be even more striking advances over the coming decades, some of which we can foresee no more than the visionaries of 1970, when I graduated from college, could foresee America's amazing transition from a purveyor of goods to a purveyor of information. The land of big shoulders, Carl Sandburg's land of big shoulders, has become the land of smart guys and gals with uh, pens in their pockets, CD players in their computers, and beepers on their belts. Hardly anyone saw it coming, but here it is. What I'm saying is that I don't see all empty chairs when I close my eyes and open the eye of my imagination. I do believe there are people here today who could still come to a reunion a hundred years from today. But as I say, I think you hardly would need this lawn to accommodate them. Uh, ever since we started today, I've been listening for the cry of a baby. Usually there's at least one in attendance. So today when I actually needed one for my speech, of course, I didn't hear a single one. But if you had heard a crying baby today, that would be your most likely 100-year survivor. Always assuming the world itself continues to survive. And while a few of them might show up in wheelchairs or on walkers, I guess most of them would be Trey Spry. Alzheimer's? Nah. Most of them will have ninth generation computer chips in their heads, serving as firewalls against that particular problem. Diabetes? Maybe, but those who have lost their limbs to the disease will probably have computer-driven prosthetics, which will have complete range of motion and even feeling. They'll occasionally itch and go numb if you fall asleep in the wrong position. So there will be 100-year survivors, but I have to tell you the scary truth, because that's my job. You know the old proverb, don't you, about the woman who carries the drowning scorpion across the raging stream? Once they're on the other side, it stings her, and as she staggers to her knees, dying, she reproaches it for ingratitude. Come on, lady, it says. You knew I was a scorpion when you picked me up. And you knew I was the scary guy when you picked me for the job, so deal with it. <laughs> Any trustees, board of directors, faculty at our 100-year get-together in 2101, maybe... I got maybe a couple of faculty, but no, no, I'm going to be there. Grandparents, gone, of course. Aunts and uncles, gone. Parents, with a couple of exceptions, they'll be gone. Graduates, let's be generous here. Fourteen surviving members of the class in the year 2101. Fourteen surviving members of the class of 2001. Men ranging in ages from 119, let us say, to 122. Many more little brothers and sisters, except by 2101, the annoying little brothers and sisters are going to be old, gray, slow, and cranky. Plus any of those crying babies that you might have heard. Now I'm sure that there are those here, I hope the number's small, but I'm sure they're out there, who feel that I am being tasteless, casting gloom, even the pall of death, on what should be a joyous and wonderful day. Let me reiterate the obvious. You knew I was a scorpion when you picked me up. Besides, I never met a graduate, ages 22 to 25, who didn't believe he was going to live forever anyway. You won't, but if you want to believe that, that's fine. And I do have a point to make. And because I do, I apologize not at all for pointing out the simple fact of your mortality on the day of your commencement. <laughs> Let us suppose the world has that coming century. Let's suppose no one decides it's time to start the next nuclear exchange in Pakistan or Jerusalem or Kansas City. Let us suppose that you go forth from this happy place in good health 
and no one drops a safe on your head, hits you with a taxi cab, or dumps you out of a hot air balloon. Let's suppose that cancer misses you, that you continue to run and work out and avoid Mickey D's, and your heart grows stronger as the years grow longer. Let's suppose you're fortunate enough to land the job that you want and the friends that you love and who love you and maybe even a life's mate that you can reach over and touch in the night when the hours spin long and you've got the blues. Let's suppose you have those things, that fullness of time. I wish that for you. I do. I wish you the passion of this springtime, a long and productive summer, and a harvest right beyond your dreams come fall. But you have to think about what I'm talking about. There's a Jackson Brown song, The Pretender, that goes, I'm aware of the time passing by. In the end, it's the blink of an eye. They say, and it's true, time is short. That human life is brief when placed in time's wider perspective is something we all know. I'm asking you to consider it on a more visceral level, that's all. Think of all those empty chairs a hundred years from now is frightening. Yet, it also offers some valuable perspective. What are you going to do, Vassar 01? What are you going to do? Who's going to be the doctors? Who's going to be the lawyers? Who's going to be the writers? Who's going to be the painters, the politicians, the executives? Who's going to look around at the age of 45, surprised as hell to find himself or herself as the head hotel concierge at the Hotel Carlisle in New York City and say, how did I wind up here? What are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you one thing you're not going to do, and that's you're not going to take it with you. I'm worth, I don't know exactly how many millions of dollars. I'm still third world compared to Bill Gates, but I'm, on the whole, I'm doing okay. And a couple of years ago, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found out while I was lying in a ditch at the side of a country road, covered with mud and blood and with the tibia of my right leg poking out the side of my jeans like the branch of a tree taken down in a thunderstorm. I had a MasterCard in my wallet, but when you're lying in the ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts MasterCard. If you find yourself in the ER with a serious cardiac infarct, or if the doctor tells you that the lump in your breast really is a tumor, you can't wave your diner's club at it and make it go away. My life as it happened was saved. The man who saved it was a volunteer EMT named Paul Phillibrown. He did the things that needed to be done at the scene, and then he drove me to the nearest hospital at roughly 110 miles an hour. And while Paul Phillip Brown may have an American Express card, I doubt very much if it's the gold one or God save us the black one, where you get double frequent flyer miles and special deals at Club Med. We all know that life is ephemeral, but on that particular day and in the months that followed, I got a painful but extremely valuable look at life's simple backstage truths. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed when we go out, but we're just as broke. Warren Buffett, gonna go out broke. Bill Gates, gonna go out broke. President Ferguson, is gonna go out broke. Steve King, broke. You guys, broke. Not a crying dime between you. And how long in between? How long have you got to be in the chips? I'm aware of the time passing by. They say in the end it's the blink of an eye, and that's how long. Let me give you some rough numbers, okay? Class of 2001, because I looked into the matter. I don't get asked to do graduation speeches every day. I'm more of an Elks kind of American Legion guy. Stand up, get the rubber chicken, and then go home. But for you, I looked it up. If everyone graduated on time, your class would consist of 624 men and women, but things come up, as we say in the vernacular, shit happens, and probably fewer number will actually get diplomas today. So say 600. Now let's take an average salary for a Vassar graduate. When I say average, I mean knocked down to reflect the scuffling early years when you won't be paid what you're really worth and won't care if you're normal what you're going to care about in those early years is getting to see you 2 or Wilco in concert. 
So we'll say 41 grand, averaged out over your entire career. Now let's say each one of you works for 40 years. Given those marvelous medical advances we were talking about, many of you may work longer, but let's say 40 years. Given those numbers, those very conservative numbers, this group as a whole can expect to earn $984 million during its active years in the American economy, $984 million. Not Bill Gates' numbers, but it's not bad. And Vassar is only one of many colleges, good colleges, graduating seniors today. Almost a billion dollars right here. And so what? I'm aware of the time passing by. They say in the end, it's the blink of an eye. The scary man said I was going to go out broke. And uh, the scary man actually says a little more than that. The scary man says, that all the money you will earn, all the credit that you will swing like Tom Sawyer swung his dead cat on a string, the stocks you will buy, the mutual funds, the precious metals that you will trade, all of that is mostly smoke and mirrors. You will continue to put your pants on one leg at a time, no matter how many T-bills you have or how many shares of General Electric you have in your portfolio. It's still going to be quarter past getting late whether you tell the time with a Timex or a Rolex. No matter how large your bank account, your kids will still play their music too loud when you get to be my age. No matter how many credit cards you have, things will sooner or later go wrong with the only three things you have that are really your own, your body, your spirit, and your mind. Yet for a short period, let's say 40 years, the nearest blink, there's blink of an eye in the larger scheme of things. You and your contemporaries are going to wield enormous power. The power of the economy, the power of the hugest military industrial complex in the world, in the history of the world. The power of the American society you will create in your own image. That's your time. This is your moment. Don't miss it. I think my generation did, but I don't blame us too much. It was over in the blink of an eye. It's easy to miss. Of all the power that will come shortly into your hands, gradually at first, then with a speed that will literally take your breath away, the greatest is undoubtedly the power of compassion, the power to give. We have enormous resources in this country, resources you yourselves will soon command. But they're only yours on loan, only yours to give for a short while. You'll have it, and then you will die broke. In the end, not long. I came here to talk a little bit about charity, and I want you to think about it, not in a little way, but on a grand scale. Should you give away what you have? Of course you should. I want you to consider you, you're making your lives one long gift to others, and why not? All the other stuff you have is just on loan. All you want to get at the getting place, from the Maserati you may dream about to the retirement fund some guy will try to sell you on sooner or later, none of that is real. All that lasts in this world is what you pass on. The rest is smoke and mirrors. Don't I think wealth, and some of you are going to finish up very wealthy, although you may not believe it now, should be kept in the family. Some, yes, charity begins at home. Those of you who have been able to pay for the college educations of your sons and daughters who sit here, their Basser educations, have done a wonderful thing. It's a great gift. If you're able to go on and give them a further start in life, a place in business, possibly help with a home, so much the better. Because charity begins at home. Because up to a certain point, at least, we are all responsible for the lives we add on to the world. But I think the most chilling thing a young man or a young woman can hear is, someday all this will be yours. And of course, the runner-up, I did it all for you. <laughs> I think what a lot of new grads would like to hear is some version of, you're on your own, good luck, call if you need help, and reverse the charges. <laughs> Here's another scary thing to think about before you leave here and before I leave you and President Ferguson touched on it. Imagine a nice little backyard surrounded by a board fence. Dad, a pleasant fellow, a little plump, wearing one of those aprons that says, you may kiss the cook, 
is tending the barbecue. Mom and the kids are setting the picnic table by the backyard, pool, fried chicken, coleslaw, potato salad, a chocolate cake for dessert. And standing around that fence, looking in, are emaciated men and women, starving children. They are silent. They only watch. That family at the picnic is us, ladies and gentlemen, today. The backyard is America, and those hungry people on the other side of the fence watching us sit down to eat include far too much of the rest of the world. It's Asia in the subcontinent. It's the countries of Central Europe where people live on the edge from one harvest to the next. It's South America where they're burning down the rainforest to make room for housing developments and for grazing lands where next year's Big Macs are now being raised. Most of all, it's Africa where AIDS is pandemic, not, not epidemic, but pandemic, and starvation is a simple fact of life. Am I overstating? Well. America contains 5% of the world's population and uses up 75% of the world's resources. So, you tell me. What we scrape down the kitchen dispose of after Thanksgiving dinner for a family of eight would feed a Liberian village for a week. So you tell me if I'm exaggerating about how much we have. And the Woodstock generation, my generation, which set out to change the world has, by and large, subsided into a TV-driven existence of quiet and unobtrusive selfishness. While our national worth has tripled over the last quarter century, the help we give the world's poor has sank back to 1973 levels. So, you tell me if I'm overstating the case. In West Africa, the average lifespan of a human being is 39 years. So you tell me if I'm overstating the case. In West Africa, infant mortality in the first year is 15%. So you tell me I'm overstating the case. Almost a third of West African children are dead by their third birthday. So you tell me I'm overstating the case. We've elected an administration, I guess we elected them, we might as well say we did, they're there that takes a dim view of charity as national po of policy. George W. Bush talks about compassionate conservatism, an oxymoron that's right up there with jumbo shrimp, <laughs> and, human ex and humane execution. <laughs> compassionate conservatism, come on. Does he think he's dealing with a bunch of idiots? I guess I better not go on that way. <clears throat> All right, what he's talking about basically has been Republican Party bedrock for 100 years. It amounts to don't give a man a fish, give him a fishing pole and teach him to fish. This, of course, would be before idiotic conservation and environmental policies render the whole concept of fish irrelevant. My own philosophy, partly formed as a young college graduate without a job waiting in line to get donated commodities for the kids, is by all means give a man a pole and teach him to fish, but people learn better with full bellies. Why not give him a fish to get started? Giving isn't about the receiver or the gift, but the giver. It's for the giver. One doesn't open one's wallet to improve the world, although it's nice when that happens. One opens one's wallet to improve oneself. I give because it's the only concrete way I have of saying I'm glad to be alive and that I can earn my daily bread doing what I love. I hope you will be similarly grateful to be alive and that you will also be glad to do whatever it is you wind up doing. Even that guy who's going to end up as the concierge at the Hotel Carlisle. Giving is a way of taking focus off the money we make and putting it back where it belongs, on the lives we lead, the families we raise, and the communities that nurture us. I wish you the most pleasant day, both graduates and families. I wish you the joy of your fellowship, one with the other. This isn't a hundred years from now. It's just today. Today we're fine. Today nobody's better than us. Uh-uh. But when you go somewhere and sit down and break bread with your friends and families, as most of you will, I want you to remember that image of the hungry people and the dispossessed people and the unhomed people who are standing on the other side of that backyard fence. 
For the most part, they do not want to harm you or take away your joy in this day. They only want what you want, what I want, or what we all want. Food for themselves and their children, clothes for the body, a roof to keep the rain off at night. There are people who need these things right here in Poughkeepsie, as well as in India and Sierra Leone. Many of you know that. In April of this year, Vassar College held a panel discussion called Faces of Homelessness. Duchess Outreach is one local organization dedicated to helping the hungry, the sick, and the homeless in this town. They're at 70 Hamilton Street. If you want to write that down, get out your pen and write it down. Duchess Outreach is at 70 Hamilton Street. It's near a part of this town that's quite different from this green and pleasant campus. A part of Poughkeepsie where you might feel a trifle uncomfortable walking at night if you were by yourself. Duchess Outreach operates an emergency food bank for those who are hungry and have nothing to eat. They run something called the Lunchbox, which serves midday meals six days a week. They have a children's clothes closet for kids who need pants and coats and shoes. They provide nutrition, information, and emergency services for homeless people and people with AIDS. I don't, as a rule, talk about charitable giving. I actually do happen to believe that the left hand should not know what the right hand is doing, or if it does, it shouldn't discuss it. Today, I'm going to make an exception to that rule. I intend to give $20,000 to Duchess Outreach in honor of the class of 2001, and in your name. What are you clapping about? I'm going out broke. It's not really too much good for me at the end of it all. Anyway, I would take it kindly if those of you who are here today would match that amount today. There will be a box up there. I want you to put a check in it before you walk out of here, or I want you to put a couple of bucks in it. Put what you can afford, each according to his or her resources. Nobody gets hurt. I don't ask you to do this because I think it will solve the problem of hunger and want in Poughkeepsie or Dutchess County, let alone in the whole world, but because you'll enjoy your own coming meal more and the fellowship with your friends and family more fully, knowing that you shared your joy and your good fortune in having been a part of this happy occasion. And don't let it be a one-shot. Let it be the beginning of a life's giving, not just of money, but of time and spirit. It repays, not least of all, because it helps us remember that we may be going out broke, but right now we're doing okay. Today, no one's better than us. Right now, we have the power to do great good for others and for ourselves. So I ask you to begin the next great, great phase of your life by giving and to continue as you begin. I think you'll find that in the end, you get far more than you ever had and do more good than you ever dreamed. I salute you and I thank you.